fallout. The nuclear wasteland beckons, calling out to you like a dry whisper on the irradiated wind. Jump on into your own deadly adventure. Here are the stats. Let's get into it. You get a rules reference, which should be totally useless to you after you finish watching this. 21 map tiles, split across 8 dangerous green tiles, 6 deadly red tiles, and 7 special double-sided tiles. How you put these together and what story you'll have is decided by one of the 4 scenario sheets. To represent you and your friends, you get 5 plastic figures, 5 character cards, and 5 character-specific special tokens to stand in as the survivor you'll be playing. Speaking of tokens, you get 35 special tokens split evenly into the 7 stats of Strength, Perception, Endurance, Charisma, Intelligence, Agility, and Luck. You also get 27 enemy tokens, 8 yellow critters, 7 gray humans, 4 blue robots, 4 red monsters, and 4 green super mutants. Similar, but crooked ever so slightly, are the faction tokens, 5 blue shields, and 5 red stars. These are affected by the two ever-present power tokens, a blue shield of security and a red star of freedom. To keep track of your capital in the capital wasteland, or wherever you may want it, you have 54 cap tokens split into red ones and blue fives. As you change over your journey, you'll receive some of the 12 double-sided trait tokens, two well-rested slash addicted tokens, two idolized slash vilified tokens, and two super mutant slash synth tokens. These will go on your player board, one of four, which come with the eight necessary connectors. You'll also need these 12 pegs, four each of gray, green, and red, one for each survivor. You also have many treasures to find, shown on these 34 loot cards, 25 asset cards, and 11 unique asset cards, which can be earned from exploring these encounter cards, 34 wasteland, 21 settlement, and 20 of the hidden vault cards. Of course, you'll need to complete some of the 100 quest cards involved in your scenario to earn the all-important Agenda cards, granting you the influence you need to win the game. Whatever you do, do not mix up the quest cards. Sometimes, those quests will require these cardboard quest markers. There are eight of them, four sets of two. As you take on challenges and battles in the wasteland, you'll need to roll these three custom VATS dice to determine the outcome. If you're successful, you might even level up and earn some of these 14 precious, yet powerful perk cards. Don't spend them all in one place. Whomsoever gains the required influence for their player count will have achieved their agenda, making them the winner. You can't play if you don't set up, so let's get it done in just 9 easy steps. Step 1. Choose the scenario you'll be playing. I personally like Far Harbor, but I'll be using the simpler, the Commonwealth, for this demonstration. Put the scenario sheet you chose above the play area. Step 2. Build the map. Just follow the picture on the back of the scenario sheet. Make sure all of the arrows are pointing to the top of the map, or that the dangerous and deadly symbols are oriented right side up, face down. Step 3. Shuffle the special and enemy tokens separately face down. Separate the enemy tokens by type. Then. Separate all of the other tokens into snacks and piles, within reach of all the players. Step 4. Separate and shuffle the starting encounter cards, the ones with the stars in the upper left corner, into a wasteland deck and a settlement deck. Leave all of the remaining encounter and quest cards in numerical order and place them nearby. This is the card library. If you need to find a card in here, be careful to only look at the numbers in the corner and not to read any of the spoiler-packed text below. Step 5. Set up the agenda deck by removing any agenda cards that have a number in the bottom left corner higher than the number of players you'll be playing with. Then, separate and shuffle the agenda, loot, and asset decks face down. Put these in the play area, along with the perk cards and unique asset cards, which you won't shuffle. Put the VATS dice where all the players can reach them. Step 6. Deal four asset cards in a face-up line next to the asset deck to form a shop. Step 7. Randomly pick a first player. Place the agenda deck to their right side. Going clockwise, everyone must choose a survivor. They get that survivor's figure, character card, and starting special token. They then place their figure in any unoccupied space on the crossroads camp tile, which is present in every map. Step 8. Each player takes a player board 
and places a green peg in the zero hole, a red peg in the 16 hole, or whatever your character's max HP is, and a gray peg in the leftmost hole of your XP track. They then place their starting special token in the corresponding slot on their XP track, along with an additional random token that they now draw. If they get the same token they already had, they'll redraw it until they get a different one. Each player draws an agenda card, which is always kept secret, just like agendas should be, and three caps. Step 9. Follow all of the instructions on the back of the scenario sheet to start your first quest, and place any scenario-specific baddies on the board. Place a matching face-up enemy token on all visible enemy icons on the map. Finally, place the power tokens on the topmost space of the power track. Let's get playing. Each round is made up of one turn for each player, then a single enemy turn. On your turn, you may take up to two of these actions. You can usually take the same action twice in one turn, but we'll get into that later. You can explore, which reveals an adjacent face-down map tile and opens up new locations and enemies. Move, to get your character from one end of nothing to the middle of nowhere. Quest, to complete your objectives and further your agenda. Encounter, to experience this world for yourself and test your might with challenges and fights. Speaking of which, you can fight an enemy on your space in an attempt to kill it for loot, XP, and dominance. Finally, you can camp to recover your HP, regain the help of your loyal companions, and maybe even trade with your fellow survivors. Then, once everyone's had a turn, the first player draws the top agenda card to activate enemies, either moving them closer or causing them to fight the survivors. The rounds repeat like this for the rest of the game. Just keep moving forward, keep your chin up, and maybe you'll survive long enough to find out. Fallout shall conclude in one of two ways. Either a survivor will gain enough influence to be declared the winner, or one of the factions will reach the final space on the power track, causing the game to immediately end and all of the survivors to lose. Okay, if you thought the setup was long, strap in folks because this is a hefty game. Let's get into the full actions. Explore is the simplest. If you're on a space that borders a face-down, unexplored map tile, state that you're exploring and flip that tile face up. If there are any enemy icons on that tile, place a face-up enemy token of that type on that space. Next, move. When you declare that you're going to move, you immediately get two movement points. You can spend both points right now, or you can spend one, take your second action, and then spend the other. Movement points don't carry over between turns, so use them efficiently. Some spaces have terrain, represented by the color of the space's border. Difficult red terrain requires two movement points to enter, but a standard one point to exit. Irradiated green terrain inflicts one rad on the survivor entering it. This means you must move the green peg on your player board right one hole per rad you take. Keep in mind, if your red HP peg would ever be on or to the left of the green peg, your survivor will be killed. More on that later. The quest action requires some specific criteria. Look on the current staged quests. If one of the requirements has the quest icon, you'll need to perform the quest action at the specified location to complete it. There can't be any active enemies in that space, and all other objectives on that option must be completed first to complete that quest and trigger the card's results. If a quest doesn't have a quest icon, it's automatically completed once the objective is met, even if the person completing it wasn't necessarily trying to. In either case, you'll need to resolve the specified card results from left to right. To add, find the specified card in the card library Take a number of cards from the top of the specified encounter deck equal to the number of players. Shuffle the added card into those cards, then place them all back on the corresponding deck. If there isn't a deck that the added card matches, like the vault encounter cards, put them next to the other encounter decks to form a new deck. To stage, find the specified quest card in the card library and read the text on it aloud. Place it face up with the other quest cards. If the card has XP, the survivor that completed the quest gains that much XP. We'll get into XP and leveling up later. To become something, the survivor that completed the quest takes the specified trait 
and puts it in one of the slots on their player board. If they already have that trait, ignore this. If they already have the reverse of that trait, that token flips over. If they already have the reverse of that trait, but their current trait has a lock, it doesn't flip and nothing happens. If the results have a loot, asset, or agenda icon, you draw a card from the specified deck, sometimes more than one if there's a multiplier. To gain a unique asset, just go into the unique asset deck and take the specified card. If another survivor already has that card, draw a random unique asset. To shop, you'll either buy or sell up to the specified number of items from the shop. I'll explain the shop more later. To Star Plus or Shield Plus, move the specified faction's power token down the board a number of spaces equal to the pluses after the symbol on the card. Finally, to Trash, remove the quest card from the game. If a quest doesn't say Trash, it stays in the play area and can be completed again. The encounter action is where the big decisions happen. If you are on a space with an encounter action and there are no enemies on that space, you may perform the encounter action once per location per turn. This is the only action that can only be done once per turn. The player to your right draws the top card from the corresponding encounter deck and reads the italicized text at the top of the card aloud. Then, they read the bold text below that. If one of the options says forced and the survivor meets the specified criteria, the reader must read that option and the survivor is forced to do it. If they don't meet the criteria, that option isn't available to them. If there isn't a forced option, the reader reads all of the bold text options, including the necessary tests to accomplish them. The survivor performing the encounter action chooses one of the options and performs the test, fight, or payment required. For tests, they roll the VATS dice. If the hit icons are equal to or higher than the difficulty of the test, they succeed. If not, they fail. However, if they have the stats specified, they may re-roll any number of dice, once each per stat, to try for a better final roll. For fights, they must draw one of the enemy tokens specified and immediately fight it. I'll explain fighting in the next action, but suffice to say, if they don't kill the enemy, they fail. Whether they succeed or fail, the enemy token is discarded. For payments, just discard the caps specified to succeed. If you don't have the caps, you can't take that option. After the tests are tested and the fights are fought, the reader reads the appropriate succeed or fail text and resolves the effects the same way you would on a quest card. Any wasteland or settlement icons in the results are variables, representing the level of the location where the encounter happened. If the encounter doesn't say trash, place it face down on the bottom of its deck. Now we get into the real crunch of the game, fights. If you are in a space with an enemy token, or a space adjacent to one, and you have a ranged weapon equipped, you may use one of your actions to fight them. If you're doing a ranged attack, you'll even inflict one additional hit. Specify which enemy you're fighting, then roll them bones. You may re-roll once per stat you have that matches a stat on an equipped weapon. Once your roll is final, you take one damage for each hit icon on the dice. Subtract hits equal to the armor number on the apparel you have equipped. Move your red HP peg one hole to the left for each damage. Like I said before, if this peg moves to the same hole as or a hole further left than the green peg, your survivor is killed. When you're killed, the fight and your turn immediately end. Move your figure to any space on the crossroads camp tile. Discard all of your unequipped inventory and put your red HP peg back to your character's max HP. If the green peg is in that hole, you lose. Discard all of your things and, if you're the first player, the player to your right becomes the first player. If you took all your damage and weren't killed, you deal one hit per dice that has a highlighted area matching one of the enemy's vulnerability. If the hits you deal equals or exceeds the enemy's level, the enemy is killed. You gain XP equal to the enemy's level. Discard the enemy token from the map. Place a random enemy of the same type, face down and inactive, on the closest matching enemy icon on the map that doesn't already have an enemy of that type on it. 
If multiple icons are the same distance away, the first player chooses one. If you didn't get enough hits to kill the enemy, it remains on its face. Hits don't carry over between fights, so don't expect to wear them down. The final action is camp. If you're not in the same space as an active enemy, you can use an action to camp. You may recover 3 HP, must unexhaust all of your exhausted cards, and you gain the well-rested trait if you don't already have it and aren't addicted. You may also trade with any other survivors within one space of you. You can trade anything except traits, special tokens, perks, or the ghoul's starting card. You can also trade promises, but there's nothing making you keep them. You have to both agree to a trade, so no trying to force a trade. Those are all the actions, so let's delve into the enemy turn. After all of the players have had a turn, the first player draws the top card from the agenda deck. Ignore the text, and focus instead on the dastardly enemy icons nestled in the bottom right of the card. They activate one by one, causing the corresponding enemy tokens to attack any player trapped in a space with them, or an adjacent space if they have the ranged ability. Once all the dust is settled, the enemies that didn't fight march one space closer towards the closest, helpless, mostly innocent survivor. They ignore terrain and can leap entire face down tiles in single strides. If they're on one when that tile is explored, the exploring player chooses the space they'll be on. If they move into a space with a survivor and have the aggressive ability, they'll fight right then. If an enemy has two survivors to choose from, they'll pick the one with lower HP. If they're tied on that, the first player will decide for them. If two spaces are equidistant from the nearest survivor, the first player chooses where they go. Finally, all of the face-down, inactive enemies on the map are flipped face-up. They do not move or fight this round. If the last agenda card is drawn for the enemy turn, or at any point in the round really, you'll need to reset it. Shuffle the agenda discard and flip it face down to create a new agenda deck, which will be passed to the player to the first player's right. They have now usurped the role of first player and will have their next turn at the beginning of the next round. Finally, advance both of the faction tokens one space down the power track. With all of that said, to win, you need to get agenda cards from quest results. The agenda cards are worth one influence plus additional influence if the criteria on them is met. Agenda cards are always private information, and you can only have a maximum of four. If you must draw more, you'll need to discard agenda cards to make room. The winner will be the first player with the right amount of influence for your player count, like so. If any other survivors also had enough influence, they can reveal their cards to share the victory. However, if either faction reaches the final space in the power track at any point, the game immediately ends and that faction wins. Unless that token's movement would give one of the survivors enough influence to claim victory first, all of the survivors lose. Be sure to include any excess movement past the final space in your influence calculation. This game is pretty chunky, so there are quite a few fiddly bits to explain. First, the quest markers. If a quest card mentions these, take two markers of the same color and place one on the quest card. Place the other on the map where the quest card specifies. I <sighs> feel like I've said some variation of specifies like a hundred times in this video. I'm, I'm getting at the source. Hold on. Okay, there's like five different variations on that. Uh, yeah, I'll just switch those around. Anyway. When the quest is trashed, Put both quest markers away. Now, inventory and equipment. Anytime you acquire an item or companion, place it under the inventory slot on the far right of your player board. Your inventory normally can only contain three cards and is public information. If you gain more than your inventory limit, you must discard down to your limit. If you get equipment, you can equip it to one of your three equipment slots. One apparel, one weapon, and one companion. These cards can only be used when equipped, and they don't count towards your inventory limit. You can only equip when you get a new card, when you start your turn, or when you perform a camp action. Some cards, like companions, must be exhausted to be used. To exhaust, turn the card 90 degrees clockwise. You can't use them again until they're unexhausted, 
aka turns 90 degrees back counterclockwise, which usually only happens during your camp action. When you unexhaust a companion, be sure to check the text on their card. If you don't meet the conditions written there, you'll have to discard the companion, shoving them away like trash into the wastes. The shop works like this. When you're prompted to shop by an encounter card, draw one card from the asset deck and place it to the left of the other four shop cards. Now, you can buy or sell items up to the number stated. To buy, put the number of caps pictured on the upper right corner of the asset card in the shop into the public cap supply. Then, put the card in your inventory or equip it. If a card shows a trait or token instead, you just need to have that trait or token to take it. To sell, discard the item you want to sell from your inventory and take caps equal to the card's cost, minus one. Finally, discard or draw asset cards to bring the shop back to four cards. Next up, enemy abilities. Aggressive means that the enemy will immediately start a fight when you enter its space or it enters yours. This fight doesn't count as an action. Armor means that you must deal one extra hit over the enemy's level to defeat them. Loot means that when you kill that enemy, you get to draw one loot card from the deck. Radiation means that if you take any hits from that enemy, you also take rads equal to that enemy's level. Retreat means that if you fail to kill that enemy, when the fight's over, you flip the enemy face down. Now, let's get into XP and leveling. Each time you earn XP, advance the gray peg to the right, into the hole under a stat you have, once for each XP you earned. If there are no more stats to the right, put the peg in the leftmost hole in the track and continue advancing right from there. Each time you wrap around like this, you gain one level. When you level up, draw two random special tokens and add one to your player board. If you already have the stat you chose, put the token back in the pile and instead, take one of the corresponding perks from the perk deck. If there are no perks for any of the stats you have, you get nothing! To use a perk, discard it back to the perk deck at any time on your turn before, between, or after your actions to gain the effect described. Now, some clarifications on traits. If you are ever instructed to lose a trait, you must discard it, whether it has a lock or not. Well rested is special. You may discard it at any point during a test or fight to gain one reroll. So, the wasteland isn't formidable enough with friends. You want to go it alone? All right, here's how solo play works. You follow all of the standard rules, with these exceptions. Quests that require you to be in the same space as another survivor require you to be on a settlement space instead. If that survivor would need to make a test, they got a three. When resolving encounter cards, don't read the results before deciding which option you'll take. Finally, when the agenda deck is empty, only advance the power token that's currently behind. If they're on the same space, move them both, as normal. Best of luck out there, survivor. So that's Fallout. That should cover everything. But if you still have any questions, put them in the comments below. If you liked this, please take the time to click like, subscribe, and the notification bell. It would really mean a lot to me. Thanks for watching, everybody. Oh, and one more thing. This is the final episode in season one of Whiteboard Games. It's been a ton of work, but I've enjoyed the entire ride, and I hope you've all enjoyed watching. I'll be back again later in 2020 with season two, which will have some fun games like Puerto Rico, Root, maybe Oath if it's out, if not, it'll be in season three, the game Village, and some other card games and things. Let me know if there's anything specifically you'd like to see in Season 2. I'm going to upgrade my whole setup so it'll look even nicer than it did this time. Once again, thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you in Season 2.